Welcome to this Screen Skills presentation, which is going to be on the Corona Job Retention Scheme, and in particular on its implementation in a media context. Now, as Emma said, my name is Kerry Stoner, and I'm a tax partner at Wigan. Um, and Wigan is a law firm specialising in advising those in the media sector in particular. Um, and presenting with me today is my colleague, Seth Rowe, who is one of our um, employment law specialists there. Now, at Wigan at the moment, we are working closely with our media clients of all sizes, um, who are currently in the process of implementing these rules. Um, we've also been liaising directly with the Treasury, who have, of course, had to design and implement this scheme at what is, by policy standards at least, um, breakneck speed. Um, and as part of this process, we've been feeding in suggestions on the design, as well as working with them on the published guidance and getting it as tight and user-friendly as possible. Um, now, the aim of this webinar is to give you, uh, as viewers, um, the opportunity to learn more about the detail um, of the job retention scheme, um, including the latest updates on that, um, and specifically um, its application to you um, within the media industry. Um, so, as Emma said at the, the outset, this is an educational webinar, so it's not specifically um, legal advice, but we do want to give you the chance to ask um, any questions about the scheme features, um, as I know there are probably many. Um, both as we go through the slides and also afterwards. Um, and we will do our best to answer as many of these as we've got time for today. So moving on to um, read the first slide, um, which is essentially an outline and just to give you an overview um, of what we're going to cover during the talk. Now, first of all, we're going to start off with something of a helicopter view um, of the scheme itself. Um, and that we'll, we'll cover the main um, aims and policy objectives of the scheme and also the key features. Um, Seth will then take over to run through the eligibility criteria. Um, so this will really look at which companies um, can apply for a grant, um, or which employees within those companies will qualify for the scheme and are potentially capable of being furloughed. Um, we're then going to look on at, importantly, um, exactly what you can claim. So I'll talk you through what you can claim and then how. Um, and so here we'll look at how much you can claim um, per month per qualifying employee and um, additional amounts in addition to the salary. Um, and we will also start to look at the process um, of, um, of when you can make these applications and how you go about doing this. So some real um, practical help, hopefully. Um, we will then talk through um, sort of furlough in practice. And this is really just applying the rules um, to some common scenarios in a media context, which can, in certain circumstances, stress test the application of the rules. So it's really going to be looking at things like contract extensions and re-engagements, how far you can backdate furlough, can you rotate furlough, and certain requirements you need to meet during furlough to make sure you continue to qualify. Um, Seth will then go through um, employment considerations, because essentially the general employment law overlaps and overlays um, these, this scheme. So it needs to be considered um, carefully when putting the rules into practice, um, especially when you're selecting employees, for example. Um, and finally, we're just going to look at next steps. So these are really going to be action points. So just looking at what you could or should um, be doing today in order to, um, to successfully claim under the scheme. Um, and finally, we're going to move on to a kind of a formal Q&A session to cover any questions you might have that you've come with or that maybe arise out of what we've, what we've run through today. So to begin at the beginning um, with um, a sort of an overview, um, as it says here, the coronavirus job retention scheme was announced by the Chancellor relatively recently um, on the 20th of March. Um, originally, it was set to run from the 1st of March through to the 31st of May. Um, but as of the end of last week, as probably many of you have heard, um, it's now been extended to the end of June. And this is really to mirror the extension of the lockdown period. Um, I'm sure none of us can forget um, when the scheme was introduced, um, and which is essentially when the UK went into the lockdown. And that's really important because it provides both the context and also the rationale for the scheme. Um, so if you look at the primary objective of the scheme here, it's really to protect jobs and avoid mass redundancies across the country as a result of COVID-19 and in particular the lockdown. So it's part of a collective national effort to really protect these jobs. 
to enable people to stay at home whilst also enabling employers to retain staff. Um, and the, the thinking being um, that this is essential to obviously rebuilding the businesses in the future when we all go back to something more like normal. Um, it's expected certainly to be key to survival of businesses and the recovery of the UK economy after the crisis and of course the, economy, the recovery of the media sector. Um, however, when you move on to looking at the design, um, achieving this objective um, is obviously limited by two factors. Um, the first is clearly the amount of public finance available. Um, the Treasury does not have bottoms coffers and secondly also the need to prevent abuse. So a lot of the detail the rules were struggling with really go to um, protecting these, these two aspects. Um, the essential um, skeleton of the scheme though, um, as I've set out on the side here, is it is reimburses employers 80% of the pay of employees up to a cap of £2,500 per employee per month. And that's if those employees can be correctly categorised as furloughed. Um, so basically, um, it, this is UK employers, so it can be companies or um, partnerships or not-for-profit organisations with a PAYE scheme. Um, and it applies to employees who would have been made redundant or asked perhaps to stop working um, as, as, a, as a result of the COVID-19 crisis, but who are, who are being kept on payroll. And essentially, you furlough the workers. So HMRC reimburse the employer for 80% of their wages in order to safeguard those workers from being made redundant. Um, in addition to the 80% of wages, there's also some additional sums that are allowed in relation to employers' national insurance contributions and pension contributions, but we'll come on to the detail of that later. Um, but it is important to remember that this is a grant, not a loan. So there's no requirement to repay the sums that you apply for now. Um, so looking at the criteria and implementation, for a successful claim, you need to meet certain criteria and you need to follow the correct processes that are set out in the Treasury's direction um, and also, um, also the um, guidelines themselves. Now the eligibility criteria must be met and Seth will work through the detail of this in the moment and also the process in terms of informing furlough employees must be um, touched on too. But we, we will cover this um, in a little more detail in later slides. For those who are not employed, those who are self-employed or perhaps a member of partnership um, and who have also lost profits due to COVID-19, there is a separate scheme um, available and the self-employed um, in income support scheme um, and that may be an alternative to these furlough rules. However, we are running a separate webinar on that tomorrow. Um, so in the meantime, I'll pass over to Seth now who will run us through some of the detail of the key eligibility criteria. Hey, thanks, uh, Kerry, for that. So, as, um, as, as Kerry said, I'll, I'll be looking at eligibility. And unfortunately, um, in terms of who's eligible under the scheme, we're perhaps in a situation now where it's a little bit more complex than it perhaps was originally intended to be. Um, and, and that's that's perhaps not on, not sort of um, sort of hard, hard to. Uh, understand given sort of it, it, it's a very sort of new scheme that's been put together quite quickly but we are sort of in, in a situation where there are particular criteria which in some ways seem to apply a little bit inconsistently so it's important to be aware of exactly what those criteria are and how they'll apply so in terms of an employer when will an employer be eligible to claim under the scheme well the employer needs to have had a UK PAYE payroll in order to bring a claim, but they must have started that payroll scheme on or before the 19th of March 2020. Now, originally the cutoff date for payroll was the 28th of February, and that was extended last week. So 19th of March 2020 is now a key eligibility date for, for sort of having a payroll scheme in place. The employer must also have enrolled for PAYE online, and they must also have a UK bank account. So all of that is relatively straightforward from an employer's perspective. So if an employer is eligible, who can they actually enrol? What, what employees are eligible? So in terms of employees, there are actually two particular situations which are relevant. There are the sort of criteria for employees who haven't yet had their contracts terminated. And there is sort of separate criteria for individuals who have had their contracts terminated, 
but they are then eligible by effectively being re-engaged and placed into furlough. Now, for someone whose contract hasn't been terminated, then they will be eligible if they were on the PAYE payroll and had been notified to HMRC on an RTI submission, so that's a real-time information submission on or before the 19th of March. However, if you're in a situation where someone has had their contract terminated and you would like to re-engage them and place them into furlough, then they will only be eligible if they were employed and on your PAYE payroll and had been notified to HMRC on the ITI submission on or before the 28th of February. So the old cutoff date still applies in respect of re-engagement, but the new cutoff date of 19th of March applies if someone has not had their contract terminated. Now, there's, there's, we're going to come on to fixed term contracts and extensions a little bit later, but in terms of fixed term contracts, it's just worth bearing in mind that you can be eligible to claim a reimbursement for someone on a fixed term contract, but only while that contract is still running. So if that contract is due to expire during the furlough period, then it's important that you renew or extend that contract in order to be able to re um, or can continue, continue the claim for that individual. So that's just in terms of eligibility for fixed term contracts, something to bear in mind. So who actually will be regarded as an employee for the purposes of the scheme? Now, fortunately, this is a little bit clearer. Um, and there's a quite a large category or, or a large group of categories of individuals which potentially could be regarded as employees. So anyone on a, a sort of a, a, a classic employment contract, whether that's sort of part time, sort of full time, permanent or fixed term will be eligible. Um, but also, if you're not on an employment contract and you're a worker, um, and often this is known as a LIMB worker, then you will also be eligible if you are effectively on the employer's PAYE payroll. So in a sort of a, a media context, there's quite a lot of freelancers out there who are effectively regarded as PAYE freelancers, and they would be regarded as workers and are very likely to be eligible to be enrolled under the scheme. But if you're what's known as sort of a, a Schedule D worker or, or a sort of a self-employed worker, then you wouldn't be eligible for the job retention scheme. Office holders are also relevant where they've been paid by PAYE, so that will include statutory directors of companies, um, so in, com directors on the board, and also company secretaries. We also know that apprentices are eligible, um, provided they've been paid via PAYE and they meet the, the other criteria. Agency workers would also be eligible, although in terms of their eligibility, it will generally be the employment business who effectively employs them that would need to make the claim for them. And then finally, salaried partners of limited liability partnerships are also eligible. There's quite a, a large group of, of employees that, that would be eligible for the scheme. Just, just before I hand back to Kerry, there's a couple of sort of other points regarding things that could affect eligibility, which you should be aware of. And we want to make you aware of these just, just right at the outset of the talk. Firstly, agreement or consent. One of the things that was um, sort of set out in the Treasury direction, which Kerry's already mentioned and which was published last week, um, was an indication that you actually require someone's agreement to furlough. And effectively what the Treasury direction stated was that you need to instruct someone to cease work because one of the key requirements of the furlough scheme is that you must not work or provide service to your employer. And the Treasury direction stated that you must provide an instruction to your employer that they must not work and that that instruction must be agreed in writing, although that can be done via an email. Now that actually contradicts the guidance um, and, and actually even the guidance that was published on Friday but it's likely that the Treasury direction's position probably um, is, is the one to follow and it would appear therefore that agreement and consent to furlough is a requirement of eligibility. Also under the Treasury direction it appears that if you are currently off sick or currently eligible to receive statutory sick pay then you won't be eligible to be placed on furlough. Um, 
So the Treasury direction would appear to suggest that for someone who, for, for example, is currently self-isolating as a result of COVID-19 and, and perhaps eligible or in receipt of statutory sick pay, you would need to wait until they're fit to return to work before furloughing them. Unpaid leave also could affect eligibility. So if you are on a previously agreed period of unpaid leave, so that's previously agreed prior to the 28th of February, then you would have to wait until that period of unpaid leave has come to an end before you place someone into furlough. Whereas if you have placed someone on unpaid leave after the 28th of February, then you can actually backdate their furlough claim, which we'll come on to later. Now, the rationale for those dates is that presumably any unpaid leave that was agreed after the 28th of February is more likely to be COVID-19 related and therefore the scheme should apply. But for sort of previously agreed unpaid leaves, perhaps sabbaticals, etc., then obviously the government doesn't want to extend um, eligibility in those circumstances because the person essentially wouldn't have been working anyway um, during that period. And then finally, before I hand back to Kerry, then this is just quite crucial. It's very clear that you can only make a claim under the scheme if someone is placed on furlough for a minimum of three weeks. You can't furlough someone for one week or two weeks. They have to be effectively furloughed for, for that three week period, otherwise the claim will fail. So I'll hand back to Kerry now who will take you through sort of how to actually bring the claims and what, what you can actually claim. Yeah, but thanks Seth. Um, so yeah, assuming that you've managed to pick your way through the eligibility criteria successfully, um, really I think the next question would be um, how much um, can you claim, how much are you entitled to claim in respect of an employee? Um, now, I'm just going to look at a little bit of the detail, therefore, of um, the amounts and how you calculate these. So, um, as the slide says, the reimbursement will be calculated per employee, and it will be 80% of that employee's um, gross relevant salary. So, that's their regular wage, really, up to a maximum of 2500 per month. Um, so, really, when you look at this, it's going to be the lower of 80% of their regular wage and £2,500 per month. So um, depending whether your employee is on a fixed salary or variable pay, um, the, cal the, the way you um, calculate their, the reference salary effect effectively is slightly different. So for those with a fixed salary, um, this is fairly straightforward and it's simply taken as the salary in their last pay period prior to the 19th of March. So for most people that will obviously be the month of February. Um, but for employees with variable pay, um, it's the higher of the same month's earning for the previous year or um, the average monthly earnings for 2019 and 2020 tax year. So that, that can obviously can um, be a little bit more complicated to and require a little bit more thought, um, depending on the exact circumstances that the employee you're looking at. Um, it's also worth bearing in mind here that there are some amounts that are excluded from what's considered to be um, a salary or wage. Um, and in particular, that um, the ones that may be relevant are um, commission and bonuses, they won't be included and nor will any additional fees received. Um, there's also some um, particular rules that go to any specified benefits that have been paid or liable to be paid in respect of an employee um, during the period, the employee's period of furlough. Um, and that really goes to statutory benefits for um, sick pay or maternity pay, um, paternity pay, for example, and, and bereavement. Um, so once you've sorted out your relevant salary, you are potentially able to claim additional amounts. Um, and there's, two, there's two types here. Um, the, the first is the pension contributions payable on the relevant salary. And so that really is, um, well, it'll be the minimum automatic enrollment at employer pension contributions. And the amount that's allowable is the amount that's contributed either by the employer um, or 3% of, of the gross earnings paid to the employee. So that will um, obviously vary on a case by case basis. Um, and then you come to national insurance contributions. And here we're talking about the employer's national insurance contributions. And those are um, also claimable for, as part of the grant, um, in addition to the, the, the basic salary claim. Um, and employers are entitled to be reimbursed um, on those contributions that are payable um, in respect of the, um, the relevant salary. 
So moving on, I thought it'd be useful just to take you through here um, exactly really the maximum that can be claimed in respect of any um, individual employee um, on furlough for any given month. Now, um, as Seth mentioned, um, you have to be furloughed for at least three weeks. Um, so any furlough and grant will be um, pro rata, um, you know, in terms of how you calculate it. But let's assume that if you are furloughed for the entire month, um, the maximum you could claim for an employee on that basis would be the, the maximum cap on the salary, which is £2,500 per month. Plus, when you crunch the numbers, um, the employer's nicks on that amount would actually work out to be in the region of um, £245. And if you have an auto-enrolled pension contribution, so you can claim the, the pension um, slice of the grant as well, you will have an additional um, entitlement to £59 um, when you crunch the numbers. So in total, you're looking at um, something around 2,804 of a total possible claim for under CJRS. And that's the grant that can be applied for per employee, like I say, per month when they are on furlough for the entire month. Now, Obviously, not everyone will be um, neatly on furlough for the entire month and earning um, a top amount either. So we've just worked at, through here an example calculation. So this will be, really be the number crunching you'll need to do when making the claim. Um, and it really is three steps looking at each of those um, three aspects in turn. Now, to calculate the CJRS grant for your reference salary, um, the, what you would do is a first step would be you would take the gross salary, so the amount that's being paid to the employee, um, for the days on furlough in the month. So as you work out the day rate effectively, so either it's at £2,500, if that's the top figure, divided by 31 days if we're taking March as the example month, um, or if your actual salary, the amount paid over, will be less than £2,500, you divide simply by the number of days in, in the month, and here we've taken March, um, and that, that would be your day rate. Um, and then you multi the amount that you're entitled to would be multiplied by the number of days on furlough during that month. So if you're looking at the first month when these rules came in, which was March, where the, the announcement was made on the 19th of March, so I think your first possible date for claim would therefore be the 20th of March, you're really looking at, um, you know, 12 days or below for that month. So you'd have to do this then um, when you're making, making the application for March. Now, having done that, you then calculate the, um, the grant on employer's national insurance. And so again, you go through a similar process whereby you, you calculate the national insurance contribution for the, the sums received both whilst not on furlough and on furlough if, the, if you went on furlough for the whole time and then divide by the number of days in the month so again if you were looking at March you'd be looking at 31 days and then you would apportion according to the number of days on furlough in that month um, and a very similar process again I mean you're probably getting an idea by now in terms of the grant for the pension um, so I just thought it was useful just to point that out because actually when we go on to look at the next slide and how you claim it is the onus is actually on the employer and a sort of to, to do the calculation and obviously it's in the employee's interest to again make sure these these numbers are correct so if we now move on to look at um, how um, you can claim um, now happily as coincidentally and um, the job, HMRC job retention scheme portal it was being launched today so it went live this morning so up until today as an employer you couldn't actually put in a claim for um, a furlough grant. Um, but as of this morning, it's been open and people have been using it. Now, no doubt we're here how um, successful and smooth a process this is for people or not. Um, there's probably quite likely to be a, a massive overload on the system in the first few days, I imagine, if people, as, you know, backdated claims are put through. So it will be under some pressure. And obviously, like any new tech, um, there are often teething problems. But um, let, once we've worked through those, and once HMRC have worked through those, um, I'd just like to talk you through the process. There is actually a really good in-depth in guidance released by HMRC, a step-to-step -step guide for this that's definitely worth taking a look at. Um, but just as a way of overview, um, basically just to point out that um, it should be the employer or perhaps their appointed payroll agent, if they have one, um, who must submit the furlough claims to HMRC's portal. And it's really important this is done. It's not an automatic um, right to, to this grant. You've got to submit an application. Um, so you access um, the system, um, you will need to have a gateway ID and a password set up and also an active POA enrolment um, number. So um, the claims then should be made using the amounts on your payrolls. So the quantum of claims recalculated 
as per our earlier slide, um, but using those, those amounts. And the details you are required to put in, we've fleshed out some of them um, on the next slide, just to give you an idea of the amount of detail that you will need to have to hand when making the claim. Um, so in all cases, you're going to need the total amount of the claim, but you need to split out um, you know, um, between the actual reference salaries you're claiming and then the total pension and national insurance contributions. Just really enables HMRC to audit the figures that are going in because what will happen in practice is that HMRC will audit this back to your real-time information um, as you've reported it. And that this will be the check against fraud and just to make sure that these claims are legitimate and correct. Um, and so as, in, as well as the actual amounts, um, you obviously need to provide details of, of who um, you're claiming in respect of. Um, so that will be the employees' details, um, including their, um, you know, their, their personal you know, NICS numbers, etc. You also need to put in employers' um, bank accounts as well as your address. Um, and um, in terms of the number of, um, and, of employees you have and how that impacts the actual process, um, the cutoff or the differential seems to be at about 100 employees. So if you have more than 100 employees, you'll need to provide some more additional um, detail. Um, and that's basically a breakdown um, per furloughed employee and the, the relevant claim period. And just, just prompted to, our, to provide a little bit more um, clarity on those points. Um, now, in terms of assisting with cash flow, um, the, the, uh, the promise from HMRC is that the employee will receive payment within six working days of making an application. So that's the time that they need to turn that around. So, I mean, if you sort of um, work backwards from that to um, perhaps the payment date to employees, say you, you pay your employees on the last day of the month, you need to have really made sure if you are relying on this money um, in terms of cash flow, or simply you want comfort to know that you've got a successful claim, you really need to make sure that you've done, um, submitted your application at least six working days before um, the, the, the end of the month. Um, so that's it for me in terms of the detail. Um, we will basically, um, when I'll pass back to uh, Seth, who will look at um, furlough in practice and um, yeah, from the employee's perspective. Thanks, Kerry. So um, in terms of what we mean by furlough in practice, this is just some of the, the sort of more interesting aspects of the scheme, which we've been advising on over the last sort of three, four weeks since the scheme was announced. And um, probably sort of topping the bill of those is contract extensions and re-engagements. And this is something which has been on sort of everyone's lips for at least sort of a week and a half ago now. And this is um, sort of, unfortunately, an area which isn't entirely clear based on sort of the current drafting. Um, so it's a little bit up in the air. But um, firstly, just in terms of general principles, what, what we are fairly clear on at the moment, um, and as I mentioned earlier, is that you can re-engage someone who has effectively stopped working for you on or after the 28th of February, provided that they were on your POIE payroll by that date, as I mentioned earlier, and place them into furlough. Um, so that principle is, has been established and it doesn't just have to be in a situation where they've been made redundant. It could also include a situation where, for example, they've resigned um, to go elsewhere. So that principle um, seems to be pretty much locked down. We also know that you can extend fixed term contracts. Um, but what's become kind of a little bit more of a, a question mark is whether or not you can extend someone's contract or re-engage someone's contract when they're on a fixed term, which effectively would have or has naturally come to an end. Um, now, sort of the position sort of 15 days or so ago when, when we were looking at, I think it was the guidance that was announced on the 9th of April, that there was a general assumption that that probably would be possible. Um, but sort of since then, there has been some comments that have come out of sort of HMRC officers and also um, some of the guidance that was published on Friday, which potentially brings that into question. And where we are at the moment is it would appear that you can effectively extend a fixed term contract, um, provided you do that before it comes to an end, even if it would have come to an end naturally during the furlough period. And the new guidance seems to make that pretty clear, which is, which is good to know. 
it, it's, a, it's a little bit more of a grey area still, unfortunately, whether you can actually re-engage someone whose fixed term contract has already ended, given the sort of most recent drafting. And our, our sort of view on that is that you probably do have to be quite cautious, but it would appear that there's a little bit of a contradiction between the section of the guidance that deals with re-engagement and the section of the guidance that deals with fixed terms. So that's, that's obviously an area where we will be sort of doing what we can to sort of follow that up with the Treasury directly, um, and we, which Kerry will be picking up on, but it, it is unfortunately a little bit of a grey area still at the moment. Backdating is another um, area which we've had a lot of questions on. Can you backdate someone's claim? Now the fact that the scheme was announced on the 20th of March and it runs from the 1st of March would imply that backdating is possible to a certain extent and actually the original guidance did mention backdating within it so that would imply that backdating is possible but you've got two circumstances which you need to think about carefully in respect to backdating you've got backdating someone's claim where they ceased work for you um, from a certain date for, for example earlier in march and you've got a situation where someone's had their contract terminated can you backdate the start of the re-engagement? Well, in the first example, provided that someone effectively ceased working for you and was on effectively unpaid leave, and provided that they're, you're not um, kind of breaching the unpaid leave criteria that I mentioned earlier, so it's, it's unpaid leave that was um, effectively agreed on or after the 28th of February, then it seems clear that you can backdate to that point but it's important that you're not backdating to a point where they were carrying out work for you so if someone has genuinely been uh, or ceased work then backdating should be possible and that is relevant in this industry because i've obviously a lot of sort of tv and film productions for example went into hiatus and individuals had their contracts suspended so in that um, those sorts of circumstances backdating should be possible in terms of backdating the start of a re-engagement we originally thought this probably was possible, um, but actually given the guidance and some of the new language that was introduced on Friday, this has been called into question a little bit because in the section on re-engagements in the guidance, it now states that you can only effectively start someone's claim from the date that a decision is made. And presumably, um, it's not entirely clear, but presumably the decision that's being talked about there is the decision to re-engage someone, which would potentially make it a little bit problematic in terms of backdating someone's re-engagement. Rotating furlough leave is another thing that, um, that we've been dealing with queries on over the last few weeks. This potentially could be quite useful, um, and we now know it's possible under the scheme. So this is a situation where you effectively place individuals on furlough um, and they do a few weeks on furlough or at least the three week minimum period and then they come off furlough um, and perhaps have a period of working and then go back on furlough. Um, now this could be potentially quite useful in situations where actually some work is needed um, by a business but not yeah, there isn't work for everyone to do um, and we'll come on to sort of why this might be relevant from a selection point of view but potentially it's quite a useful thing uh, a useful sort of tool for employers to have in their arsenal but we would suggest that you take a little bit of care when addressing this in your furlough letters because what you probably don't want to be doing is having to sort of reissue um, furlough letters each time that you're wanting to bring someone back on work and then back into furlough so something you probably want to pick up there and then finally, just one of the requirements during furlough leave, I know we've mentioned this already, but it is just worth emphasising again that no work or services should be carried out by the individual while they're on furlough. Um, and there's been a question mark around sort of, well, what, what does that actually mean? But it pretty much is anything that could generate revenue for the employer. Now, what the individual can do is they can undertake training for their employer. They can volunteer. So there's obviously a lot of volunteers at the moment uh, volunteering to help out the NHS and the care sector. They can do that and they, that will jo not jeopardise their furlough. And they can also work for other employers. Although you should bear in mind that your employment agreements with certain in individuals may prevent them from doing that. So if you were going to allow them to work for other employers, then that's probably something that you need to give their, your consent to. So just finally from me, before I hand back to Kerry, what are some of the other employment considerations for you to bear in mind? So furloughing by agreement, as we've mentioned, um, now seems like it, it's clear 
that, that you do require someone's agreement and consent to furlough them. But this isn't actually that new, even though it was sort of set, set forth in the Treasury direction. Our advice over the last few weeks has always been that in the majority of cases, you're going to require someone's agreement anyway, because if you're only going to be paying the 80% rate or the capped rate of the furlough payment, then you'll effectively be varying someone's employment contract because you'll be reducing their pay down from 100%, and that would require someone's agreement. And actually, there's probably a number of other things that you potentially would want to um, amend in respect of uh, someone's contract as well, such as perhaps ceasing certain benefits uh, while they were on furlough. So agreement to furlough um, and vary their contract is quite important. Selection is again something else which potentially is quite relevant. Um, if you're in a situation where all of a, a group of employees are going to be furloughed, then selection is, is not going to be um, that important in terms of how you do it because you're, everyone will effectively be, be up for furlough. But if you're in a situation where you need, a, say, three or four people to do work, but there, you haven't got work for sort of 10 people in a particular role, then it would be sensible to follow some form of fair selection process um, and we would suggest that a process perhaps similar to a redundancy selection so we're looking at objective criteria would probably be a fair sort of method to sort of decide who potentially should be furloughed and, and who shouldn't and again that's where sort of rotating furlough potentially could be quite useful um, Maternity leave and sort of family friendly rights, that's another consideration. Um, one of the things that we now know is that if an individual is um, effectively on, say, for example, maternity leave and they would like to be placed on furlough, then the relevant pay that they should receive during the furlough period should be based on their normal pay, their normal pre maternity leave pay and not the pay that they were receiving during their statutory leave. But the important thing to bear in mind is that if you decide as an individual to go on to furlough while you're currently on maternity leave or in another form of family friendly leave then that will bring that leave to an end and there may therefore be in some circumstances arguments why you might want to go on to furlough because it could mean that your earnings go up in that situation you need to be a little bit careful because your statutory rights that attach to the maternity leave potentially would come to an end so again that's something to think through carefully what if an employee becomes sick during furlough? Um, so as I've said it, earlier in the talk, if you're already sick, then it appears under the Treasury direction you can't be placed on furlough. But if you become sick during furlough, the guidance suggests that the employer has a choice as to whether or not to pay statutory sick pay or to carry on making furlough payments. But if the employer chooses to reduce pay to the statutory sick pay level, then those payments won't be reclaimable under the scheme. But if they carry on making furlough payments, then they, they will be um, reclaimable. Um, and it's actually also worth pointing out that over the weekend, and this sort of shows how, how the situation is changing so rapidly on this, over the weekend, HMRC updated its statutory payments manual. And that suggested that if someone is on furlough, they no longer qualify or are eligible for statutory sick pay, um, which actually contradicts the guidance slightly. And what that would appear to suggest is that if an employer puts someone onto that statutory sick pay while they're on furlough, it could potentially bring their furlough to an end. Um, and that could actually jeopardize the whole eligibility of the particular claim. So that's a possible area just to be a little bit careful. Holiday um, has been a question mark up until Friday as to exactly what the government's position on that was. And what we now know, based on latest government guidance, is that holiday will continue to accrue during someone's furlough leave. Um, they can take holiday during their furlough leave. And if they do, the government says that they should be paid 100% of their pay and not 80% of their pay for the days of holiday. Now, we, we actually question whether or not legally that is correct, because we think there is an argument that it would only be 80% of pay that is due to in respect of holiday that's actually accrued during the furlough period. But obviously the guidance is now out and that's um, presumably what most people will be working on. But it's just worth bearing that in mind when you're thinking about sort of what the costs are associated with furlough, because holiday potentially is an additional cost which people may not have factored in initially.
Collective consultation is something else which has been mentioned in the guidance and um, I'm not going to go into very much detail on this but essentially if you're an employer and you are contemplating making 20 or more redundancies within a 90 day period then you will trigger collective consultation obligations which are horrifically complicated and ideally you would probably as an employer prefer not to trigger them um, but potentially they could be relevant if you are making furloughing decisions for a large group of individuals and you suspect either that a large number or at least 20 won't agree to furlough or at the end of the furlough period potentially you will be letting those employees go and in a situation where either of those are relevant potentially those obligations could be triggered so you just need to bear that in mind what happens at the end of furlough leave well that's a, that's a choice for the employer so there is no obligation for you to provide work to an employee at the end of furlough so potentially you're looking at a situation of either bringing the person back to work um, possibly agreeing a change in their terms so it may be that you bring them back part-time and you agree that with them or you may be looking at a redundancy situation and for individuals with two years service you'd have sort of your unfair dismissal rights to bear in mind and for anyone else you'd have your contractual responsibilities set out in the employment contract and then finally just from me what alternatives are there to furlough are there any well there will be situations where furlough is not appropriate and actually commercially that isn't isn't what the business would like to do potentially in a situation where actually you know at the outset that there is just going to be no work left for the individual at the end of the um, furlough period so potentially the alternatives are redundancy um, and but the but the other possibly sort of more important one is in a situation where you may not have full-time work for an employee but you may want them to do certain things. And as I've said, one of the key requirements with furlough is that you do no work and provide no service to your employer. So if you want them to do something, if you want them to work part time, then furlough is not going to be appropriate. So you'd have to be looking at sort of amending their contract and getting an agreement to reduce their time down to part time and on reduced hours. So there's various things to think from, through from an employment perspective. And I'll now sort of hand back to Kerry, uh, who'll sort of take you through the next steps um, from this point. Hi again, yes, thank you. And um, in terms, I'll be very quick on this, because there's, there's questions coming in. So this is really just to run through a, an overview of the action points from here. Um, so from an employee's perspective, it's really important to understand the implications of these rules for you. And I know lots of the questions go to this, which is why um, we will we'll spend time now trying to answer as we can. Um, it's also looking at where an employee is furloughing, making sure that there's a communication process there. As Seth mentioned a number of times, um, there's a need for consent. So it's just basically making sure it's a two-way process and that you provide your consent, that you understand what you're consenting to, you know, the, the dates, the deal, etc. Um, and also whilst on furlough, just make sure that um, whilst you can't work for your employer that's prohibited by the rules, um, at the end of furlough, make sure you're clear what happens next in terms of, you know, day one back in the office, as it were, or the home office at least, um, you know, where, where, what happens then. It's just ensuring the communication channels and plans are just um, discussed and that you know exactly what your status will be at the end of the initial period and, um, you know, where, where you should be and what you should be doing. And from the employer's perspective, um, it, it, there's a kind of process to, really to, to work through when um, applying these rules. I think we've gone through much of this, but just to, um, to a high level summarise, it's really important to review your workforce to determine who is eligible under the criteria. It's really important from a relationship perspective to ensure there's a transparent selection process. Um, it's also really important clearly from an employment law perspective to make sure that that is, um, it abides by um, the, you know, the general employment law. Um, it's also important to communicate clearly just to avoid any um, misunderstandings, to make sure that given that consent is needed, that you have the consent that you need. Um, and it is actually part of the direction that you do um, write to your employees, as, as mentioned earlier, to inform them of their status and obtain the consent for this. Um, finally, from both sides, if, you're, if you've got an existing contract and needs any amendment, as a result of your agreement in relation to this process, then clearly that needs to be done properly and um, with mutual um, consent. So it's really important that you don't stand still. I mean, from our perspective, my action points personally are, and I can see from many of the questions coming in, that to make sure that these rules are as clear as possible in terms of the guidelines that are being issued and amended as they go 
um, and also from um, I guess from your perspective to advise you to enable you to make sure that you are applying these correctly um, and to make sure most of all that nobody involved in this process um, has any scope at the moment to stand still it's a it's an evolving um, situation um, there's an ongoing requirement to monitor HMRC guidance yourselves and also your, obviously your commercial position to see where you stand um, in respect of your um, employees or also as an employee you know to um, you know communicate your your personal position with your employer so that can be taken into account when making these decisions so I think we're um, we're ready for um, questions now I think we've got about 10 minutes left to answer some of those questions and whilst Seth was um, was was talking during his last couple of slides I did see some of the questions that are coming in and just to deal with a couple of them that I think we haven't addressed specifically um, first of all I think one of them was a possibility that the um, the, the furlough period will be um, will start will be the extension for the cutoff will be post the 19th of March um, given that it's been extended already from the 28th I think is probably the context of that question so it was originally the 28th of February and last week it was extended to the 19th of March but in many cases um, I think the short answer to that is no the reason that it's the 19th of March is because um, and that's the cutoff point for having a contract at that time in some circumstances is because that's when the announcement was made so it's just to prevent abuse it's to prevent people taking people on as new employees after that date and trying to claim um, a furlough grant in respect to those employees so that won't happen um, one of the other questions that I've seen come in is do these rules apply to all employers and you know yes there's no there's no size criteria and um, I think is the direction of that 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 um, question the thrust of that question it doesn't matter what size your company is whether you've got a couple of employees or you're you're somebody who's a goliath in the media world um the the the, the, the scheme is available to you if you meet the the other criteria such as having a payroll and being a uk company etc so i think um the short answer there is yes um seth i don't know if you had a chance to look at some of the questions and maybe um address a few i think the um the, the third one that i saw coming in um, was going to the um, the ability to actually um, uh, for this, these rules to apply to a fixed contract that has naturally expired and as Seth mentioned in the last couple of slides um, this is really kind of a, a, a hot question at the moment the guidance um, was changed last Friday um, it did was changed in respect of um, fixed term contracts that have expired. But the exact meaning of that and the implications of that are still under discussion. Um, and we are actually um, liaising with the Treasury um, to try and gain clarity on that. And they are um, obviously hugely busy today with the portal launch, um, but we've been told that we should have a specific response and hopefully clarity added to the guidance over the course of this week. Yeah, I mean, I think all, all I would add on that is that, yeah, it, it, and I can see the frustration in the question on, on that point, because it's obviously very significant for the TV and film industry in particular. Um, yes, it is frustrating and it's not in line with what um, Wigan or other advisors uh, generally um, assumed would be the situation based on the second set of guidance that the, the government um, revealed. I suppose the, the rationale behind it, if, if actually that, that the intention is that contracts that haven't actually come to an end aren't eligible for, for re-engagement, is because this is a job retention scheme um, rather than a, a sort of a, a scheme to sort of um, get cash into people's pockets at this time. But I think it was felt that when, they got, when the scheme was a, sort of expanded with the second set of guidance that actually it was a bit broader than um, it was perhaps originally announced when, when Rishi Sunak um, announced the scheme. Um, but what we'll have to see, I mean, I think the, the wording that they, they sort of um, came out with on Friday to still still potentially um, is a little bit ambiguous and I think they probably have attempted to sort of clarify it but I suppose the the key point is it's possible that the language is is just saying that if your fixed term contract has come to an end naturally then clearly your claim will will finish at that point because your contract will no longer be running and, it, and one reading of the language they've added is that actually it's just making it clear that you need to have re-engaged someone or, or effectively um, they need to be on contract to bring a claim. 
Um, now, if that is the case, then I think that could get clarified fairly easily. But obviously, it, it is possible. And one, one sort of plain reading of the language is that if your contract had naturally come to an end and you didn't re-engage or sorry, didn't extend it before that happened, then you won't be eligible. And um, obviously, we, we need to be quite quite careful when advising sort of clients in respect of, of those sorts of decisions. So we would suggest that you do take care until that point is clarified. But we, we certainly appreciate the, um, the the sort of the feeling within the industry on this point and, and some of the, of the way that this sits uneasily with some of the other parts of the guidance. So we're aware of that. And as Kerry said, we'll, we will sort of be doing what we can to try and get, a, get some clarification on that point. And given that this and some of the other points that um, are being sort of questioned, um, what there, where there is a lack of clarity in the guidance. I mean, the guidance, I think, was updated, you know, three or four times over the last 10 days or so. So I think there is clearly a, a huge scope for, for this clarification to come, um, you know, in, in, the, in the next week or so. So if you, if you have um, acted already to to um to furlough or not furlough if you have made those decisions or you know if you can basically effectively put them on hold if you've got points that are real areas of uncertainty um if you can just perhaps it might be the idea to hold off actually doing the application until you've got clarity on that point if that would be a game changer for you if you know if that would um ultimately change your course of action rather than putting in a a submission today just because the portal opens today um, so if we can get clarity this week, you know, we know that we've been submitting um, to HMRC. Um, we're also aware that there's many, um, many other bodies and the ICAW and CEOT as well are making submissions and representations just to tighten the guidelines because clearly the Treasury's problem here is they are making policy on, on the hoof, as it were. So there are all these questions that come to the application of these rules that they either haven't had time to think about yet or simply didn't think about when they were doing their original drafting and, and therefore it becomes complicated. So if you if you can wait a few days, if it is going to be a, a game changer for you, um, then the recommendation would be just to wait while we try and get clarity on these points, which should be forthcoming because they are listening and they are engaging um, with, with advisors on this.